So um, we're talking again about caring about long COVID and obviously it affects us as healthcare workers ourselves, sometimes as patients ourselves, and also for the people that we care for. Um, I've given this presentation before, but so much has changed over each month. There's probably more research on long COVID than any other single topic at the moment covering almost every body system. And so there's this presentation will be slightly longer than usual. I'll put in the references and links. What I've tried to do is give you not just the scientific literature, but also the media articles to discuss it with your patients. It's easier to have the communication basis on that. And also differentiating what happens in patients who are hospitalized versus who weren't. Too often we want to say, hey, those really sick hospital patients, they're the ones to worry about. As we're learning now with long COVID, actually that's not the case. Even asymptomatic disease often leads to um, having symptoms that can last longer after the fact. So um, these are the disclosures to do. Uh, nothing in conflict with this presentation in particular. There's research for mental health um, and echo with THR, as well as U of T on virtual care, diabetes research there. And the, um, I'm also the primary care lead for integration um, at the Ontario College of County Doctors. Um, so this presentation, particularly the mental health parts, definitely uh, weigh on Sanji's earlier work. And as a family doctor from England, Trisha Greenhall, if you haven't actually followed her on Twitter, I recommend you do. There's tons of great research she's always doing driving forward the understanding of COVID and long COVID in particular. Um, and there's no um, conflict um, of interest. And this is supported by uh, CAMH. Wherever possible, be clear what's evidence-based. Um, there's a lot of evidence gaps in long COVID and where possible we'll clarify what's evidence-informed and also where we don't have information, where there's consensus or, or best practices in care right now in particular. So we're gonna talk about the difference between acute and long COVID presentations and what are the long-term complications that we tend to see and how to approach care for people with persistent symptoms um, after COVID. So this is just a map to remind us how clearly there's so much more. Every month there's more and more research known about COVID and the long-term complications. To begin with, if you saw all the graphs, all the learning, there was an assumption that there wasn't such a thing to worry about for the longer phase. Everything was acute case, focus, crisis management, but really an assumption of, hey, if you didn't die today, you're fine. Um, if you're not sick today, you're fine. And as we're learning, that's not the case. So we have to recognize when we have the missing information, even though there was a lot of worrisome signals, from indirect care or evidence about viral infections and SARS-1, um, we tended to want to believe certain things. So that missing information is often filled with optimism and pessimism and confirmation bias as to what we're looking and hoping to see. So to be very wary about that and to recognize when we're doing that, um, both for this presentation, but always in general in our approaches to COVID um, and what we see. And this is a reminder to recognize that um, wellness obviously is affected by um, not just our physical and mental well-being, our emotional well-being, but our social being, how our family and community are doing. And the people affected by COVID have not been universally distributed. There's a lot of equity issues in who caught COVID, who's going to have long COVID, and the resources available to care for them. Um, so to keep that in mind in our care. So this is a reflection of what last year, the beginning 2020 of March would have been like. SARS-CoV, the virus, COVID symptoms acute, and this is all we had to worry about. Yet there was so much argument about what to even see for this part. This was the simplest part of the whole equation. Um, now we're recognizing that COVID is not just a respiratory infection. In fact, it is much more a primary vascular endothelial disease. It attacks the blood vessel lining and all the consequences we tend to see arise from that. Um, so what we see, for example, in the lungs is inflammation of the lining and leaky blood vessels, which then flood the lungs. And the drowning ARDS that we see from COVID is related to that process. And we'll also talk about the other complications where you have damaged the vessels in other parts of the body and you see higher rates of um, of inflammation, um, clotting, um, and damage to end organs as a consequence. So how long does COVID last on its own? Um, so the acute phase is typically described as two or three weeks. It's slightly shortened with, with Delta variant. We see a couple of days shorter for every phase as it progresses faster with the, with the higher viral load typically. There's the uh, post-acute phase, which we tend to measure up to the three month mark, the 12 weeks. It's not a uniform phase. They tend to be sudden things that show up at about a month. Um, if they're not gonna show up, then you're probably doing a bit better off. Um, but there's also a shift at three months and if things are not getting better by that time. That tells you something very significant about the prognosis going forward as well. So the name as well, we've had so many different names over the, over the last year and a half of what happens after COVID. Long COVID tends to be what patients themselves tend to prefer the most. Um, long haulers thought to be a bit pejorative. Um, the CDC had tried to call it post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV, which lasted for about a month, I think, in people's tongues. And just last month, um, 
the uh, World Health Organization called it post-COVID-19 condition. Very important nomenclature here, recognizing it's not just a syndrome, which doesn't have a defined cause, unlike other syndromic diseases that we have, um, but they're having a hard time still encapsulating it, so it's a condition for now, which is a new kind of label from a medical official um, standpoint. Um, the idea of having post-viral syndrome didn't recognize for more than 100 years. Um, even going back to the Russian flu, there was descriptions about what lasted and happened after its covering by physical symptoms. The Spanish flu had that, and even after that, we had similar things um, like encephalitis, lethargic, and other namings. So the description of the acute viral infection, where is there virus in your throat, where is there virus in your, in your lungs, and in your throat, in your nasopharynx, it lasts longer than it tends to last in your lungs in the acute phase. And then after a month, you can have more of the secondary consequences. For example, the MIC syndrome in children and adults, I'll come back to that in a moment, tends to happen after a month. Um, and so what we're seeing very clearly in the main graphs to keep in mind here are the middle and right graphs. And what that shows us is that if your symptoms are more severe and they're peaking not at a month, but later at two months, you're more likely to have problems that last up to seven months. So if your peak of severity of symptoms tends to be um, in, in less than a month, you're probably one of the, the luckier people. And even the number of symptoms, if they tend to keep on getting worse over more than a month, then you're more likely to have trouble than the ones who have the most number of symptoms at one month and there's less and less symptoms as time goes on. So a clear differentiator early on are the pathways that people take. Um, and there's been a big recognition that perhaps long COVID could be the next public health disaster that we're dealing with. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that we are already as part of that, that process now. So even the Public Health Agency of Canada described um, in that less than three month period, 83% uh, of patients still had long COVID symptoms. And after 12 weeks, that dropped down to 60%, still pretty high numbers. Now, these are higher than what we see in other literature, but that's what public health agencies review has shown. And they have an ongoing living systematic review, um, though it hasn't been updated very recently to keep in mind there. So this is the Canadian data. Um, and we recognize children are not immune from long COVID. And what Italy found early on, where, which is an active um, study where they actually were soliciting symptoms for children, they found that kids had up to more than 50% had long COVID symptoms at 120 days, which is quite a long time. And half of those were functionally impairing, meaning the difficulty thinking or difficulty breathing impaired their running around or learning. Um, so you wonder about school and catching it and what the consequence can be. The UK, as you know, has a much more kind of hoping COVID would, would not be as much of an issue and pretending it wasn't happening to some degree. Um, and they actually said, well, come to us if you think you have COVID. We're not going to follow you actively after diagnosis. So these are parents who um, thought that kids were having trouble and then had to have the gaps of coming and actively seeking assessment. Um, and they found even then that approximately 15% of kids um, had long COVID symptoms. Remember, parents who didn't even know their kids had COVID might not attribute shortness of breath or difficulty thinking to COVID if they never knew their kids had COVID to begin with. So there's a significant underestimate of the approach that the UK has taken. Um, so we've also had this graph at the beginning of the pandemic, all the ways to watch for from acute and ICU recovery and a couple of different things. What nobody talked about was long COVID. Um, and nobody thought about that as well. And the problem is it isn't just a point in time graph where you're looking at acute case numbers today. With long COVID, you're looking at a cumulative caseload. And so you're having every day's numbers adding up to the day before and only a certain percentage will have long COVID symptoms. Um, and so this graph is meant to portray what we're seeing in the literature about the jury, how much intensity of symptoms and then how long it lasts for. Because um, some certainly do wane over time and we'll go through that in a couple of moments. So even if we take a really, really low estimate, um, and this isn't supporting literature, this is just the number the science table ran with as, as a hopefully acceptable number to consider. Um, the science table in Ontario suggested that if we had 10% of people having long COVID, you'd have 150,000 Canadians and up to 78,000 Ontarians with long COVID. And you can think about the burden of care we're gonna have in a context like that. And so the symptoms we're talking about is pretty varied, but I've highlighted the, the most common ones. So fatigue, joint pain, chest pain, and shortness of breath. Um, and these are outlined um, as early as last year with um, long COVID. Here's a graph that actually is worth keeping um, handy to see the blue graphs are acute COVID symptoms and certain symptoms are a lot more common there, but many symptoms tend to get better once you get past that, that initial three week period. Um, and then the, the red lines show you that the symptoms that last longer. So for example, joint pains um, tend to um, get better faster, but muscle aches last long. Like, so muscle aches get better sooner, but joint pains last longer. So there's some shifting in symptoms as to what tends to persist. And there may be some reasons for that that we'll hint at based on the emerging um, science right now. 
Um, in total, there's 203 different symptoms already now linked to long COVID, broken up by body systems, and how they tend to ebb and wane over time. Therefore, you can use as a reference point if you have a complex patient. But of course, we use these fancy words. That's not what patients call it. Uh, the descriptions from the Wounded Healer Study um, from England that looked at healthcare workers who caught COVID last year were descriptions like just can't function, brain fog, lung burn, and trouble sleeping. Um, and the, the World Health Organization's report really emphasizes this functional impairment. We're seeing that at really high rates uh, with long COVID. And these are the different uh, ways that mediated by the ACE receptor um, injury that COVID tends to damage various end organs and the kind of symptoms you can see with that. So I'll go through the science and literature specifically right now. So for example, starting with endocrine because the pancreas gets damaged, um, especially in patients who are hospitalized with COVID. So what we see is patients who are at home but are diabetic and they catch COVID, they're up to three times more likely to be hospitalized for COVID. And what we're seeing is even if you didn't have diabetes, you end up in the hospital, about 15% end up on being diabetic by the time they leave the hospital. So new diagnoses of COVID jump up significantly. Um, there's also much higher rates of insulin dependence on people um, who are diabetic who end up being in the hospital with COVID um, when they leave. Um, looking at the kidneys, so what we're recognizing again, in people who were never hospitalized for COVID, when they had it, had mild disease, um, this is based on acute measurements um, of 1.7 million patients over 30 days, and that data is then fed into a modeling system looking at their future trajectories um, for kidney disease based on what they're already seeing and declines now. So they estimate that you're going to have 15% with new chronic disease and two times as many having end-stage kidney disease, which is dialysis or eating transplant over the course of their illness that's predicted to follow. In ICU or hospitalized patients, you see up to 13 times increase, so significant kidney damage. And there's recommendations suggesting that perhaps every patient with COVID should be monitored for kidney function um, thereafter. The frequency isn't yet established though, um, because of the damage we anticipate that there's a lot of ACE receptors in the kidney. With the heart, we see similar trends. So what we see is that somebody who's had mild disease and not hospitalized, and this is 151,000 patients in the US who are veterans. So these are now slightly older patients, um, but they found that their risk of having heart failure over the next year, even though they were never hospitalized, is 39% higher. And their risk of pulmonary embolus clots in the lungs is 220% higher. Those who are hospitalized have myocarditis up to 14 times higher. So significant um, heart inflammation, uh, heart failure, and clotting the related issues cardiovascularly. Um, now, recognizing that we know there's a lot of immune activation in COVID, that's all the cytokine storms we heard about. What we're seeing now, and this is based on um, blood work done on patients post COVID in, in Australia, they found the significant changes in a whole bunch of different immune cells from natural killer cells and neutrophils um, and T helper cells that peak at 12 to four, um, 16 weeks, so three, four months, and are still present at 24 weeks. So there's a lot of lasting immune dysfunction, dysregulation, um, inflammatory markers that we're seeing many months after people have COVID. And these are even a lot of mild disease in this population, actually not so much severe, actually. So these are not the people just in the hospital, but who are at home who might even be symptomatic in some cases. And so when we're looking, and this is a comment about COVID-19 and autoimmune disease. So there's an infamous email from um, the Trump White House um, um, physician to Fauci about the worries that they had about autoimmune disease. Um, and this is what we're beginning to see now. So um, there's two ways that the, any infection, especially viral infections, can trigger autoimmune disease as a coli. One way can be because the molecule from the virus can mimic something in the body and therefore the body misdirects attacks afterwards. Or it could be that when you're having these, all these inflammatory hormones being released by your body as it's trying to attack COVID, it may activate other cells which normally are quiescent that are already primed to attack the body. So you're boosting autoimmune disease in that way as well. Um, and so that has partly to do with genetics and severity of disease. And we're seeing there definitely is a trend. The more severe disease, the more autoimmune um, disease we're seeing following um, COVID and the more um, um, markers as well. So we're seeing a lot more of Gambari syndrome, which is that um, flaccid paralysis that can happen after the flu happening at higher rates with COVID. We're seeing the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that we saw in children, even asymptomatic children, a month later. That could be quite dangerous for the children. Um, and that's happened both here and in England and other places. We're also seeing that also happens in adults now um, at almost the same rates, actually. And they're also worried about a lot of new yet unlabeled autoimmune diseases because they're seeing symptoms they can't quite classify with existing autoimmune. But they're worried because it links to the next phase. They're seeing antibodies to many things that we didn't see autoantibodies to in other pre-existing 
um, autoimmune disease, so things in the liver um, and the GI tract that we had not seen antibodies for previously. Um, so patients who are hospitalized, as I mentioned, tend to have more severe autoimmune um, markers and disease. And so we're seeing four times higher levels of antibodies similar to what we see in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, autoimmune hemolytopenia, thrombocytopenia, and also now anti-hormone, anti-cytokine um, antibodies being seen at high levels. So now switching gears again, looking at neurologic. So there's a study in um, Norway looking at 13,000 patients who actually were not hospitalized. And they reported still at eight months, they were three times more likely to have reported memory deficits. Those who were hospitalized, and we have more um, extensive studies of them, 82% describe neurologic symptoms, but also that's a more, a larger gamut of symptoms as well. Now we can still say that, hey, these are reported symptoms in that first case, maybe it's not actually as bad as all that um, if we were to tease it apart. But when we look at a more formal study now of 81,000 patients in, in the UK, which had pre-existing pre-post cat after, before and after catching COVID, and the age here, this is of note, is probably the age of many of us on this call. It's around 47. Um, and so what they found was that even in mild cases of COVID, there was cognitive decline. But obviously, the more severe your respiratory symptoms were, there tend to be worse decline. In the most serious cases, those who were ventilated, um, they had a half standard deviation drop in their cognitive score, which is massive. That's about seven IQ points. That's more than most people lose every decade as they get older from age 20 onwards. Um, and it's actually almost twice as bad as the average strokes deficit and even worse than the average learning disability somebody can be born with. If you're looking now at that um, middle graph of the people who were never hospitalized but treated at home, the doctors kind of called them in and talked to them, um, they still had um, harm almost half as bad as having a stroke in terms of cognitive decline. Um, so pretty significant complications. When we look at the brain, we have imaging again, MRI scans before and after because England has large biobank study that's on. And they found um, in the 785 patients, those who had COVID had more significant gray matter loss, so neuronal loss in all these different areas of the brain. And also with another cognitive testing for their decline scene, they didn't see as much difference from hospitalized versus non-hospitalized in the gray matter changes. So there may be some functional reserve issue at play here where people who didn't get so sick, um, you don't notice the functional effects of their, their gray matter loss, but certainly there is gray matter loss noticed in them too. So we've seen the brain changes, what happens to the thinking changes here? And we know that somebody who's diagnosed with COVID is nearly one in five times more likely to have a new psychiatric illness at the end of that process. Um, there's also appearing to be a bidirectional relationship that may be due to sociology and other fa um, risk factors for catching COVID because people with pre-existing mental health disorders are also 65 times more likely to catch COVID in the first place. So you can think about that vicious cycle building on itself for that at-risk population. And this is a, a graph on the left showing the different kinds of mental disorders that we've seen at higher rates um, in those who've had COVID infections. And we've also known for a long time being hospitalized and more intensive treatment had more risk um, of, of, of mental health disorders, in particular also delirium. So a higher rate of delirium. And what's striking is the delirium lasted twice as long as the average delirium from other um, ICU admissions and ventilation uh, causes. So this seems to be more significant in some cases as well. So now the last mental health disorder I'll be discussing here today is post-traumatic stress disorder. We've talked about this a lot many times. The red dot is the COVID line. You can see compare, it's about 30% for COVID survivors um, to have formal PTSD. And that compares to about 20% for those who were near 9-11 and when the towers came down. So to put it in context, what we're expecting to see is quite severe. And that may have to do with the prolonged nature of the ongoing um, sensations and fear associated with being at the brink of death. So how do we manage this? So there's a rapid guideline developed with a great partnership last year in England, looking at the NICEM Institute along with the College of uh, Family Physicians um, and, and, and the sign group in Scotland as well. And they gave us a good way of approaching a very complex, still uncertain um, approach to care. So the first step is how do you even diagnose long COVID? You rely on a positive test. We know a lot of people were, were not given access to testing or even now have difficulty accessing testing. You only count the hospitalized people. We know now that's not going to be adequate. You, you rely on having evidence of immune organ injury. That's a very limited number, as we see, and it's hard to get access for that population. Or do you simply ask their symptoms? And so the consensus at that time was look at the clinical history of suspected or likely probable COVID and the emergence of symptoms after that, and that would be how you diagnose COVID. So we can see there's some um, gaps potentially in that diagnosis, but it's more inclusive and less likely to exclude people inappropriately. 
Um, the WHO just weighed in actually less than a month ago with their formal definition of long COVID for their first time. And they pretty much said the same thing. So history of probable or confirmed COVID um, and symptoms within three months um, of that time frame, lasting for at least two months that cannot be explained by something else. They had a whole list of symptoms you can consider recognizing there can be more and that children may have a different set of um, criteria and the symptoms can fluctuate and relapse over time as well. So not to consider, hey, we got to the finish line, we're done, watch longer. And the approach to care, basically making sure people have access. We know that from testing people that have access, the burden of care and, and all this complexity of body systems, we have to make sure there's more continuity in, in making sure people are not dropped along the way because if you're already having difficulty thinking, managing, navigating a system that doesn't know how to deal with the disorder or you will become even more challenging. We're all gonna have to work together in, in a interdisciplinary approach because the, the areas of care and the evidence for, for caring for chronic conditions is in working together collectively rather than any one discipline and how to bring in a more consistent approach to care, bringing evidence where we have it rather than what we're already seeing, and we've had the case discussed previously as well, of, of um, desperation and sometimes some treatments that may verge on the snake ball side of the spectrum. And a need to include patients in ongoing research, and there's a ways to do that as well. Um, and so Chris Greenhall had written an article for the BMG last year, and I put um, the link here for you for that, that talks about that uncertain picture, how to work through diagnosis and examination, blood tests to consider, um, supporting self-management uh, and medical management, how to refer, what to consider, working on the comorbidities that you can manage, but there's diagnoses that you can work on. There is evidence that's clearer, work on those. Mental health was singled out in particular there and including social and cultural supports. And this is just some descriptions about how we support that self-management, recovery-based approaches, strength-based approaches, um, and motivational interviewing. And looking at how we work together as teams uh, better as well. Um, so I'd hope to say that, hey, vaccines are great panacea, we don't have to worry about it. Unfortunately, now we have clear evidence that's not the case entirely. Um, and so there's multiple studies now looking at um, having had two vaccines, what it means. So if you had two shots, um, your chance of having long COVID symptoms lasting more than 28 days are only about 50% lower. And this is done in a large study of 12 million patients in general in the UK, but also more structured study of 1,500 healthcare workers in Israel. Um, so hopefully um, we'll have some piecing apart who's to worry more, who's to worry less. Um, hopefully the third dose will make a difference, but right now keep in mind that having two vaccines is not a vulnerability from long COVID by any stretch. Um, these are resources for patient connections. So there's Long COVID Canada, there's Twitter and Facebook sites for them that have communications and sharing. There's a great resource, a Long COVID Kids Study. We have parents can enroll their kids in a formal study, get tools for support and structured strategies to manage as well. Um, healthcare workers have guidelines from the OCFP. The Ministry of Health is planning on having hospital-based program at these hospitals so far. There's a great study, CANCOV, that you can actually enroll your patients if you're in the Toronto area that has formal study and treatment offerings for patients with long COVID. Um, and UHN also wants to make sure that you take care of yourself as well, Cammy. So please do receive cat help if you need it, and I'll stop there.